Good morning, good morning. How nice to see you all. Lots of, lots of old faces, no, familiar faces. <laughs> and, um, and some new faces. And uh, my name is Johnny Roxburgh. And how many of you are not coming to the Indian party tonight? I've got something very special to show you. How about those girls? Wow. <laughs> 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 Thought that would make you smile. God. <laughs> well, you have to. Can I tell you, when you get to my age, it's much better than looking at your toes than looking at your face. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to say is I'm a sucker for a goodie bag. And I loved my goodie bag. That was great. Thank you. Um, then I um, want to say, Folly Hire, have you seen all the great furniture outside from Folly Hire? Have you noticed that? Yes. This stuff? That, well, the chap that works in part of the Folly Hire group, I was asked to go and have lunch in the sky. This has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk to you about. I just thought it would break the ice. And, you know. and now I can actually walk around, because normally what happens is, I did one the other day, and they gave me a handheld mic, and I was going, oh, only get every second word. Um, but they had a thing called lunch in the sky. I'm terrified of heights, absolutely terrified. And so they organized this thing, which was a big table, 22 of us. In the middle of it, there were chefs cooking a barbecue. And then they were going to haul us 150 feet up in the air over the Thames. What was I thinking about? So one of the guys that runs Folly Hire, I phoned him up. He's gorgeous. He's blonde. My husband's in the audience, just in case you think I'm being disloyal. But, um, <laughs> but this boy is gorgeous and blonde and blue eyes. And you look at him and think, you know, you're young, you're, you're straight. What a waste. And, um, <laughs> and so I said to him, I'm really terrified about the concept of going up in the air. Will you come with me? But I said, you need to be aware that when we get up there, if I get very frightened, I'll hold you. I had Rob Van Helden. Is Rob here? Not yet. I had Rob Van Helden on the other side and this guy on this side. And um, I said, I'm going to hold your hand. And I said, if I get really, really frightened, I'm going to hold, and you better not be wearing any pants. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they took us up, and I was so scared. They gave me so much gin and tonic, I couldn't even undo the napkin, and I sat there. And I had a girl called Olivia Safe, who's an opera singer, and she was with me, and she couldn't sing. There was a magician who was absolutely terrified, and he kept on <laughs> dropping everything. And Rob said to me, they had these seats that you sat in, and they could turn 100, and, and you're looking at nothing, nothing. <laughs> and so Rob kept on saying, your feet are on a little platform like this. And Rob kept on saying to me, look down, Johnny, look down. And I thought, no, absolutely not. That has nothing to do with finding the best clients in the world, but it, you know. <laughs> I then want to tell you something serious. How many of you work with private clients abroad from here? How many of you, and you may be much more clued up than I am, how many of you are registered for VAT in countries other than the UK? Well, I am a... I started off life, which I'll tell you about in a second, as a chartered accountant. I did law at university. I did not come down, as they say in Scotland, come down the Clyde and the banana boat. I kind of know what goes on in life. And I'm a big believer, you, when you pay professional people, you get them to give you their advice in writing. So I asked my accountants, we were doing two huge jobs in Italy. One of them, Cristina Borsanella, where are you? Cristina Borsanella runs the Gritti Palace one of the best, which doesn't run it, she works there, she, um, but, um, but one of the best hotels in the world, and I did a party there the year before last. We closed the whole hotel for um, five days. My client spent telephone numbers. It was, it was amazing, it was absolutely amazing. And I, like a good boy, remitted all my VAT to the UK. And the VAT was a very, very substantial sum. My accountants told me, what you do is you get your um, supplier's VAT in Italy or in France or wherever you're working, you get it back through an EU something or other. Anyway, 
funny old world, I found out last year that that whole business of getting your money back, getting your VAT back, does not exist. You know, it's like one of those great lies, the check is in the post, it was a lie. And um, I finished up having to register for my uh, VAT in Italy, France. I was already registered in Switzerland. And the Italian authorities tried to charge me 120% of the VAT that I had paid as a fine. And so I was suddenly looking at bills well over a million pounds. And I then had to fast up. The fact that I'd fast up made it all, all better. Um, and I fortunately was in a position to pay the bill. But if I hadn't been, I'd have gone bust. So what I suggest, if you haven't thought about registering in countries, it's fine if you're working for a corporation, but if you're working for a private individual in any of those countries, you need to be registered and you need to, and it doesn't matter where they're based, it's where you do your job, where you do the event, and you need to then remit the VAT to those countries. And Italy and France are at the moment absolutely hot on the trail of people like us. That's the only negative thing I'm going to say to you all morning, but it's just, I think it's a, it's a, it's a real lesson, it's a life lesson, and one that I've experienced and you could learn from. If you haven't been to the Gritty Palace, you need to go. The most fantastic rooms, the most wonderful terrace, it's, it's just beautiful. Um, anyway, moving on. James asked me to come and talk about how to get great new clients. That's what I'm meant to be talking about, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, how to find the kind of clients that are charming, that allow you to be creative, and who perhaps most importantly of all, pay the bill. None of us want clients that say, oh, yeah, 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 do this, do this, and then it comes to the check at the end of the day, and that never happens. So, let me start with... Also, as I'm old, I'll probably get this wrong, and we'll have completely irrelevant slides up on this, but you know, there we go. That was a, a great party we did in Venice, and in fact, in this very building, I did a party maybe 20 years ago for Cartier. We did the launch of their beautiful new butterfly collection, and we transformed the entire building into a forest. We had girls sitting on swings, more flowers than you could shake a stick at, um, it looked very beautiful. It was a big success. It was in the days when people had money to spend. Some people do have money to spend, but their um, corporations are a bit tight these days. Anyway, over the years, I've been in business for 40 years. God, you lot are a boring bunch. You're meant to go, oh, can't believe that. You're anyway, not that old, surely. I'm not that old. Started as a child. I was wheeled, wheeled around in nappies saying, well, We'll have another wheelchair, no wheelchair, what do they call baby chair? Anyway, um, but I, I have done about 9,000 events in my life. I started off life as a chartered accountant, and I did law at university, and then one day I kind of woke up and I thought maybe I should be doing something different. So, a very, very wet Saturday night, I went to, how many of you live in London? Well, you all recognize this. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Click of the switch, modern technology. <laughs> this is a really high-end conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to the Admiral Codrington, and there I met the woman who became my business partner. And we sat, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked. I talk a lot, as you probably can tell. And um, on the Monday, we were in business. Don't quite know how that happened. And we were kind of two babes in the wood. We really hadn't a clue what we were doing. And to give you an idea of how inexperienced I was, I had to draw a circle on the dining room floor and put the dining room chairs around it to see how many people you could get around a table that was four foot in diameter. You know, knew nothing. So Rolling had um, won the Guardian Cook of the Year. And um, I sort of gave great parties and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, and Colin will know all about this because um, I saw a very, very famous... Shall we try it again and see if it works? No. 
Oh, but that's something. Should we just stop on that before we go? In? This was an extraordinary party. Edward, Edward the Seventh, who you know the king that abdicated with Wallace Simpson. They lived in a place called Fort Belvedere, and they no longer live there. But clearly, because they're dead. Um, and um, the people that moved in gave a great party at which the queen was the guest of honor. And that big thing of roses in the middle was actually a pool of water. And we had fireworks. Well, there were lots of odd things. We had it all on different levels. And so some people sitting like you're in a Chinese restaurant, you know, when your feet are down here and you're sitting like that. And some people, instead of having um, levels, um, with handrails, we put the tables where the handrail levels were. So some people were on stools and some were on chairs. Anyway, the Queen came in, and when the, there's nobody from the palace here. When when the Queen is bored, you, if, if you watch, she does this. <laughs> it's like she's cleaning out her teeth. It's definitely the sign for her to go. That, that's also when she takes your hand and she pushes it away. I know that because I had a royal warrant and I've done lots of parties for her. It's also what my husband and I do when we're at dinner, and it's all getting a bit beyond. And I look across to him and I go, <laughs> that's the time, time for us. The, anyway, they had they, nothing. It wasn't anything else, just. In, <laughs> there's always one. Um, so here we had this great pool of water, and they, the queen was taken out to watch the fireworks. And while she went out to watch the fireworks, the whole pool of water drained. And the concept was that when they came back in, this was a fully working cocktail bar with guys standing inside it, you know, doing all of this. Well, when you have one of these things, I've done several of these, you can't just pull a plug and the water comes out or else the entire tent goes down the hill. Um, you have to have the water draining into tanks. So we pulled the plug. Fireworks were seven minutes. I knew every bit of that music. And the Queen is standing outside, clearly not going. And um, the water just didn't drain and didn't drain and didn't drain. Eventually, we took every piece of linen we had to dry it. Mercifully, when the fireworks were finished, the Queen stood outside for another two and a half minutes. And when she came back in, there were all these barmen standing trying not to look as though their clothes were sticking to them as they were sweating so much. But it was a great success. Anyway, that is um, absolutely nothing to do with what I was going to tell you. Um, I went to New York, and in the 80s, there was a market, and they still exist, one of the preeminent caterers in New York called Glorious Food. But this was, in the 80s, absolutely brand new. They had the most gorgeous looking staff, and I'm incredibly shallow. I'm very, very shallow. I react really well. I don't think anybody else in this room reacts well to good-looking and pretty stuff. I think you probably all want people that are kind of 90 and you know, dragging their knuckles along the ground. Um, but I'm a sucker for a good-looking boy or girl. And they had these great staff, and they had wonderful food. And I looked at this thing, and I thought, that's exactly what I'm going to create. I was then sent, I was still working as an accountant, and I was sent off to Australia. And I went and I stayed in the brand new Regent Hotel. And there behind the reception desk, they had put those halogen lights, 12, and you need to tell me when I've got to stop, because I'll go on forever. Um, 12, 12 volt lights, and I suddenly saw all these beautiful, blonde, gilded, bronze boys and girls. And I thought, that is exactly how my staff are going to look. And we are going to create not only a great catering company, which we did, but also a fantastic party company. Now, I say this only to tell you that you don't need to have experience. You don't need to have gone to some training college to know how to learn to be a party organizer. And, and I mentor lots of young people who are trying to learn to be a party, which I love doing, and it's great, and they're interesting. Um, but all you need to have is nerve and determination and hard work, and that is how you can succeed. The only thing that we didn't have was we were very committed to doing what we were doing. We didn't have any clients. <laughs> and that's kind, of, that's kind of a fundamental thing in this game. And, um, and then I went out, and night after night, I would talk about all these wonderful parties that we were organizing and we were planning. In my head, 
we were organising and doing all these. I really, really believed them. But in reality, we were doing absolutely nothing. And then when the phone rang, people began to talk about it. Every time the phone rang, I'd say, I'm so sorry, but we're fully booked. I'm really, really, I'd love to help you. But on that day, and they would say, well, how about the following week? And I'd say, no, I'm sorry, we're, we're fully booked that week too. <laughs> it was a very, very, very dangerous thing to do. Um, it was dangerous for several reasons. One, we were making no money. <laughs> um, and if you see pictures of me, I was um, wearing, I had long hair in those days, out to here. I was very, very beautiful. Um, <laughs> I was also alarmingly skinny. And that's because we were surviving on a starvation diet. And also I smoked 40 cigarettes a day, but we had no dosh. Um, but it was, it was a brave thing to do. But you know, when we actually opened our doors, we went from zero to hero in literally three months. And the very first big job I ever did was for a company called Schlumberger, and I stuck, and you see, I've gone far away from all these things I meant to be showing to you. Um, and, um, and we hung hundreds of, Mr. Fezziwig's ball from A Christmas Carol, and we hung hundreds of dead birds and rabbits in the feather above the, um, place that they were dining and we had a baron of beef over the dance floor. It was very exciting. <laughs> um, and you know, people, people really talked and it was very fun. Um, I'm also a big believer that um, as well as talking, you need to somehow get your name out and we advertised. And oh, that's, that was the wedding of the year last year. I don't know why that's got in there. It was Caroline Sieber's wedding in, um, in Vienna. It was very beautiful. The wedding dress was 500,000 pounds. Came from, it was a present from Karl Lagerfeld. And um, we organized that over three days in Vienna. It was lovely. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you see, everybody is trying to see what's behind the emerald. Um, and in fact, I ran, this, I ran this twice, and then for Valentine's Day, I asked Tatler if they would do this, and instead of having the emerald, we put a heart, which was peel and reveal. <laughs> but they wanted 22,000 pounds to do that, so I said no. Anyway, um, but this was a great way of, and this is actually my new company, but it's been a great way of making people realize what we're doing and what we're about. We also, for some reason, had our name on the side of a London taxi. I never quite understood where that was. Um, and, ooh, I'm taking the bottom of this thing off. Um, so, the long and the short of all of this is, if you tell people what they can have and then say they can't have it, it will make them want it more and more and more. If you go down Louis Vuitton's, uh, past Louis Vuitton's shop in Paris and they've launched a new bag and you see the queues outside, that's because people think that they can't have it and they want to desperately, desperately buy it. And suddenly, we were the hottest ticket in town. I am still the hottest ticket in town, just in case you think that it doesn't. Um, and I'm also a believer that it takes as much effort to organize a small party for 30 as it does to organize a big party for 600. This was um, a little girl's wedding in Madrid. And the night before, we closed the Thyssen Born Museum. Museum and um, it poured with rain. Everything got soaked. It never rains in Madrid in May. It's always going to be hot. That was another lie. Um, <laughs> but it does take just as much effort to do a little party as it does to do a big party. I think that if you're, I'm sure you're all very experienced and, and, and blah, 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 but I think that working out what your market is is really important. And then once you've worked out what your market is, you need to go for it. And you need to create a kind of envy. Now, I was incredibly fortunate. I was asked to the Haute Couture show in Paris for Ralph and Russo. I'm sure you've all seen Ralph and Russo's. That was marketing plus, plus, plus. Um, there were, the dress code was haute couture in the middle of the afternoon. And there were all these women 
I mean, my God, I've never seen so many extraordinary clothes. They looked a million dollars and they were all vying with one another mentally about what dress they were going to buy. And the dress they were going to buy, their cocktail dresses are like £100,000. I took my, my very beautiful PA to their um, salon in um, Park Street and there was a dress that was, I haven't got a photograph here, but it was, it was sort of like this. It was green and it, had, it was short, it was painted, it had shaved sugar pink mink sleeves. My PA is blonde, shallow again, blonde, five feet eight, skinny, glamorous. And I said, you would look so great in that. And I turned to the girl from Ralph and Russo and said, how much is that? 68,000 pounds. <coughs> there was hardly a yard and a half of fabric in it. <laughs> um, but it was great, great marketing. And it's the kind of thing that they were all sitting, all those women were sitting looking at one another thinking, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to get my husband to buy it, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that you need to create that kind of feeling of, of envy, and you need to be able to contribute so that your clients think that you're extra special. Um, oh, there you are, there's the wedding dress, that was the, that was the Haute Couture show. That wedding dress was just extraordinary. Um, for years, I've done all the work for Tiffany. When Tiffany came to London, I did every party they ever had. Their shop was half that size. I put Harley Davidsons through the windows, had the windows painted so it looked like a smash and grab. We put carousels up the front. I sat, um, and I'm not looking at anybody in particular, um, I sat, um, I put outside almost naked boys sitting on big Tiffany boxes with pools of water around them and water gushing out between their legs. It was kind of a fantasy, really, I suppose, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but you know what? It was so amazing that it stopped the traffic. And then one day, Rosa Moncton, who was the chairman, said to me, I have a great suite of jewelry which I want to sell to a very rich client. And, um, and this is the whole business of envy. And I'm not being sexist, but women are, you know, um, when it comes to jewels and clothes, I'm sure they have perhaps more. I don't know. Giles, do, I don't think so. Um, and so we put the necklace and the um, earrings on a dummy and we sat it smack in front of where we were going to entertain this woman and ten of Rosa's friends to dinner. And then Rosa said, I know what we're going to do. We're going to put the bracelets round all the napkins so every woman has a diamond bracelet and we'll put the bracelet that goes with the necklace and the earrings round the woman that we want to sell it to. And I said, big mistake. I said, you put the bracelet round the napkin of the woman, one away from her, who is much more glamorous than she is. <laughs> well, can I tell you, the husband bought the jewels, the wife went home with the bracelet on, Tiffany thought we were the best things since sliced bread, and then the young couple came to me and asked me to do their wedding. Ka-ching, result all round. <laughs> but that was how you make them, um, make them um, love you more. There are, of course, not very many people in this world, but this is another lie, um, who are in a position to do all these things. But just look at this map. That was the jewellery. That's where all the billionaires are in the world. Lots in America, lots in China, 50 here in London, two in New Zealand, I suppose that's understandable. Um, <laughs> and um, the thing you have to remember with them is that they are all successful, but they're all time poor. The husbands, and this is a very, very sad truth, and over the years, I'm sure you've had this too, over the years, um, and please, I'm going to say something very politically incorrect. Philip Pledel Pierce, who's at the back here, who's worked with me for years, um, and he knows how politically incorrect I am, so you've actually got off quite lightly so far. Um, but the fact of the matter is that very often, the husbands have made a fortune. They've married their wives when they were young, the husbands are now dealing 
with some of the richest, if you're a billionaire, you're dealing with some of the richest, most high-powered people in the world. And sometimes the wives haven't grown with the husbands. They haven't been exposed to that kind of experience. And what they want you to do, and they want all of you to do, is to make them look good. They want you to make them look good in their husband's eyes. They want you to make them look as though they're part of the establishment and they need all your creative, it's jolly hot in here, we shouldn't wear cashmere when you're doing this. Um, but um, they want you to help them to be buffed up and, and, and make their husbands proud of them. Um, I think the newer the money, the better. When the money is barely dry, I love that because they need me more and more and more. And, and they are prepared to spend it. And what you have to do is, there's a great, and I can't tell you that. Um, when you go home, look at look, a, a play by J.M. Barry, What Every Woman Knows. Every bride should give that to her husband the day they get married. Um, but it's, it's all about making them feel that you have created something without in any way diminishing how they feel. And I think that that's a great skill. It's also a wonderful way for you to make money. Um, anyway, that's the, the only thing. I've got a great client, and um, she's rather like that. She's one of my best, best friends. Um, and her husband's an arms dealer. And they have just, over the years, we've, we've probably done 20, 30 parties for them. And the last party they had was a Moulin Rouge party. And she sat there wearing very improbable clothes. Um, she had a couturier make her look like she was part of the Moulin Rouge set. Um, it didn't really work. Um, but it didn't matter because she's fun. And she sat at the end. This was a back-to-school party we did for them. where We had a fully working gymnasium at the back of this where they danced. And lots of people seemed to go up on the ropes and not have very much on when they got up there. It was amazing. Um, but she sat there on this swing and she said, Johnny Roxborough, you are not allowed to retire yet. I still have three weddings. And then she looked firmly at her husband and said, and a funeral to do. <laughs> um, he's still alive. This was, I was in Utah last week. And this is a, a lesson on how not to open your mouth and say what comes in first, which I do a lot of. Um, this is the wonderful Amon Geary. And I said to the clients, wouldn't it be really fun to put 2,000 candles in the desert? What on earth was I on? <laughs> um, we got all the, all the candles um, inside those paper bags, um, came from Amazon. We had to take the candles out and put them into glasses. Then we had to open up the paper bags. Then we had to fill the bottom with sand. Then we had to put the candles in. Then we had to have the desert sprayed so it was flame retardant in case one fell over. Um, and then we had to put them out, then we had to light them, and then blow me down, the wind blew. Uh, <laughs> but it was very, very fun. Um, and I don't really quite know why I'm telling you that, except, how am I doing time-wise? How long have I got? Five. Five minutes, okay, right. So I must then tell you, I'm gonna, this is 29 pages of boring thing. I've got to tell you about one of, I'm a big believer, you need to get big families. You need to have big families. When you're doing a wedding, make sure there's another sister. Make sure they've got cousins, make sure they've got aunts, make sure they've got children that are going to have parties and 21sts. But of course you only want that if the families are rich. <laughs> if they're poor and you're having to dilute it between 10 children, you know, go, go home, it's not worth your money. But, um, and I have one very, very, very rich family. Who were the people that did this? And I've got to show you, I'm going to do this quickly. Um, and um, that's another of the woman's parties that had the funeral. Um, anyway, um, and that's a lovely wedding and uh, Chateau de Gentil and uh, come on. Um, anyway, bride for that wedding, 18 years old, the most beautiful bride I've ever, ever seen. Incredible thing. Anyway, this family, the aunt, part of this huge family, came to me and said, and I'm sorry if any of you are German, but if I try and do a German accent, it sounds like I've come from somewhere very odd, but I'll try. She said, my dear, I think it is very vulgar to celebrate any birthday that ends in a zero. So for my 77th birthday, I intend to have 150 of my friends, 150 of my children's friends, 
and 300 of my grandchildren's friends. And I have rented an extraordinary greenhouse in Munich. And you are going to do the party. And they are going to come for dinner at 6 o'clock. I said, why are they coming at 6? It is a surprise. So on the day, <laughs> on the day, that was not a marvelous wedding we did. Um, on the day, little boys bar mitzvah, it's kind of simple, isn't it? Um, on the day, I said to her, what's the surprise? And she said, the surprise, my dear, is that I'm still alive. <laughs> and you know, what was so amazing about it was that they started, that was her part of it. She also said, I hate round tables. She said, I want you to build me seating like this, rape seating. She said, come and sit behind me. So I came and sat, you have sort of, you lean back. And she said, I may be 77, but it's so marvelous to be able to lean back on a man and just... And I said, oh my God, I can't believe you're 77. She was still dancing at four in the morning, and at 6.30 we pulled the plug. I would love to be like that when I get to that age. Now, um, I just want you to see, um, I want you to just run a little video. I'm going to go through all this stuff, which is you know, miles and miles. That was another of that family's weddings. And the party in Istanbul. This was the most extraordinary party I've ever done. That was in America. 5,000 candles, 5,000 orchids. And the budget, <coughs> according to the papers, was 58 million. I was on a fixed fee. Don't you hate that? <laughs> um, and, and this is when we wrapped the, the um, natural history in white and another wedding, and that was at Buckingham Palace. And, but I just really want you to get to this. How do I make this video run? Click again. Right, I'm going to talk. And this was a very, very lovely party, and you can look at that and then forget what I'm saying, and I'll just burble on. Um, so, I think in short, the really important thing is to always over-deliver. It's never a crime being expensive. I think there's a certain cachet. People say, Colin Cowie did my party. Maybe they say that about me. I think the crime is under-delivering, getting it wrong, and the very rich are also very funny. They don't want you to disclose who has done their party sometimes. They want to keep it, that's my, you know, it's like women with a dressmaker. They don't want to let their friends know who the dressmaker is. They want it to be theirs. So perhaps they want us to be theirs, um, or you to be theirs. Um, and this man here, it was his 75th birthday, and he asked me um, if I could, his house is called um, Bruin Abbey, and um, he asked me if I could create an abbey. And so we made an abbey, and we built it inside this. While we're talking about this, the other thing I think you must always never be frightened of, that great um, party with the, the $58 million budget, whether that's true or not, but that's what they said in the papers. Um, and um, I went to see the client in America, and they took me to their estate, which was a little bit bigger than Manhattan. <laughs> and and I'm, I promise you it was bigger than Manhattan. They had this amazing house. Their money was, their money really, even the paint on the walls was touched dry. Um, and they were taking their friends and they were going to have them um, in an hotel and they were marrying their daughter in the local church and I have a video in my head and I'm able to work out how it's going to look and I can in here I can see exactly what it's going to be like and you know I couldn't see anything it was a huge blank I was working in um, Rio and I was standing on Copacabana Beach and I took a very deep breath and I phoned the client and I said, you know what, we're about to have a very tricky conversation. I said, you are dragging some of the richest people in the world halfway across it. You're marrying your daughter in possibly the ugliest church I've ever seen. You're putting your guests up in a really horrible second rate hotel and I think I'm the wrong man for the job. Can I tell you, when you're talking to multi-billionaires' wives, that is quite a big, deep breath. And she said, but it's very strange, Johnny, because 
Um, for the last three nights, I haven't been able to sleep. And I've withdrawn the save the date cards. And I'm prepared to change cities. I'm prepared to change venues. I'm prepared to change hotels. The only thing I'm not prepared to change is you. And I went, wrong answer, wrong answer, wrong answer. <laughs> and so she then um, said, I'll send you a first class ticket in three weeks' time. I don't want to talk to you till then. To the day, three weeks later, she emailed me a first class ticket. I can't tell you where this was because you would know, or some of you would know who it was. And that's something else. You've got to always be discreet. Never, ever, ever. You know, corporations are fine, but private individuals, you never mention their names. Um, and um, we, we then went and created that party. And it was just extraordinary. This party, they had um, all that framework. The inside of it was lined in mirror. And so when we did the nightclub at night and we flashed all the lasers around it, it bounced all around the inside of this, um, this kind of Gothic cathedral. Powers of Instagram, Philippa Craddock. How amazing. That wedding, when she started off, she had 3,000 people on her um, site. She now has over 100,000 followers. I think Instagram is a marvelous way for all of us to get new clients, get the right clients. And, um, et voila. Yes. Oh, lunch in the sky. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. seen a video of it actually, and I'm so glad you came to it. I'm so glad you're tight, and I'm going to go, oh my goodness, what did I do if I got it? So thank you for saying, yeah, technically. <laughs> Can I tell you, it's a great way to diet because you just can't <laughs> eat. <laughs> any more for any more. Yeah. Anybody else want to ask Johnny a question? Don't be scared, I don't bite. Well, um, I guess my business partner and I were quite um, well hooked up in London. Um, you know, we, um, we knew lots of people. And I think that um, in those days, all those luxury brands were not run by the people that run them now. They were run by people who were social, people who, who were not corporate. I mean, we're, talk we're talking nearly 40 years ago. Um, you know, Asprey's was owned by the Aspreys. Um, uh, I used to joke that the whole of Bond Street should have had a lane going down the back of it called, my company was called the Admirable Crichton. It should have a lane called Crichton Way. We did Ralph Lauren, Gucci, Vers I've opened and closed more shops. I used to be the kiss of death, because I would, I would open an incredibly, but when we did the opening of Asprey, um, something that had never happened, we, um, they had spent 110 million building the inside of the store. And it looked amazing. But of course, they'd had builders outside for months. So all the roadway was trashed, and the people that owned it were very, very keen to have a very big, glamorous party. So we persuaded Westminster Council, which has never happened before or since, to close Bond Street. We carpeted the entire length of Bond Street, the whole thing. Um, they wouldn't let me cover over the... Um, the yellow lines. So, um, because it was something to do with ambulances or fire brigade. So I persuaded Asprey to spend, in those days, 30,000 pounds on rose petals to fill in the gutter. So, and we put planters. Bond Street had never looked that glamorous. And um, we had um, boys dressed in, funny it's a recurring theme, um, <laughs> dressed in very little as window washers. So they had sort of bibs like this and great muscles and they were standing 
doing that. We had a, um, an Asprey Bentley outside, and we had um, a wheel clamp made of diamonds. I then got my dog walker to find two beautiful, beautiful um, huge poodles, and we had them all shampooed, and then Asprey purple ribbon in their hairs, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was, um, it was fun. So the point of all that is, that wouldn't have happened. Um, we had um, Prince Geoffrey and the Aspreys, who we knew, who said, and then Lawrence Stroll, and we said, you know, let's do it. And, um, and they were also people that we've met. I mean, one of the things I did, you know, th these talks are often a great source of work. I went to a funny place called Phyllis Court in Henley, the most unlikely place you would imagine you would ever get any work out of. And lots of very nice women, you know, sort of Max Mara and all that sort of stuff. And um, you know what I mean, don't you? Um, and I stood up and did this talk, just like I'm doing now. But little did I know that in the audience was the wife of one of the richest men in the world. He had gone from being a millionaire to a billionaire almost overnight with some extraordinary deal, I don't know what it was. Um, and she was absolutely charming. And as a result, she asked me to do a big party for them, which was, in those days for me, huge. Then they, they owned the Dolder Grand in, in Zurich. And they asked me to do the opening party of the Dolder Grand, and I finished up putting a huge, the, the Zurich Philharmonic outside it, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and that was just from standing up and talking. And so it was all about building those relationships. And then, of course, their friends taught. And that was, so that was how it happened. But it didn't happen overnight. Some of it did, but, you know, and it was endlessly hard work. And it was, you know, I can tell you now, for the first four years of my professional career, can you quit? Sounds so ridiculous, professional career. First four years as a party organizer, um, I earned 4,000 pounds a year. That is called living off your hump. And, um, and also, you know, I think it's really important if you're an organizer that when you're asking people to do things, there wasn't a thing <coughs> that I ever asked anybody to do. I had peeled the potatoes, I'd driven the vans, I'd cleaned the lavatories, I'd mopped up the sick, I'd told the bride's mother what pearls to wear, I'd been with the bridegroom to see how his clothes should be fitted. There was nothing that, they, that I asked somebody else to do I hadn't done. And when they sometimes, the younger members of staff would say, well, that's not really my job. I'd say, do you know what? It's all your job, and I have done all of it. And you can look them in the eye and tell them. Sorry, that's super boring. Right, okay, move on. Anything else? Or I think I'm good to go. Yes. Yeah. Two for the price of one. 40 years in the business. <clears throat> Could you possibly imagine yourself starting again tomorrow with just a laptop and a mobile phone. You don't have a website, you don't have an Instagram account, you don't have any connections. Imagine a lot of people in the room would like to know if you were beginning again tomorrow with none of the history and background that you've got, what would be the first three things that you do? <laughs> well, 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 I did start again because I sold my business five years ago, and I started absolutely on my own, working from home. Um, I didn't really quite know how to type. I knew absolutely nothing about Instagram. Um, but I did have 38 years of <laughs> clients. And I, d I don't know how you would start. I think, I think you'd need to be um, very, very brave. And um, the first three things... I'm, uh, I'd probably try and go and find somebody else who knew how to do it and talk to them. But it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. And, and I think you've got to be, um, you've just got to be brave. It's rather like taking a child and throwing it into a swimming pool and praying it doesn't drown. Um, and for the most part, they don't. And for the most part, I mean, all of you have succeeded. All of you are successful and all of you have great companies and you've done lots of things. So I, I, don't know the answer to, I don't know the answer to that one, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't got time. I've got other things to think about. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to ask me something too, and then I'm going. One more, maybe? 
this is, I guess, was the best question ever, but you've been in the business for 40 years now. I'm Don't a... Go on about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm an Italian destination wedding planner. Um, and I've been in business for about 15 years, and I had my company for almost 10. Uh, I have seen a huge changes, you know, from the beginning till now. What, you know, what's your feeling and how you feel that the industry is changing? Because with the new millennium people, you know, getting married, I think the industry has, you know, it's got a different impact and a different requests to what used to be. I totally, before. I totally agree with you. I totally agree. The days of the big lavish um, weddings are over. I'm dealing with a Saudi girl at the moment and um, the one thing she doesn't want is a Saudi wedding. She doesn't want something with you know, thousands of flowers and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think that there's a huge shift. People want something that's simple. I think that the very rich don't want to be seen to be very rich any longer. I think it's politically incorrect. And I think that there's a tremendous um, change towards things being <coughs> ecological. Um, you know, people, the number of clients that come to this is so annoying. Um, the number of clients that come to me and say they want a plastic-free event, and I'm, I am absolutely. I hope you've all got one of those funny, you know, plastic. Have you got one? Yeah, I knew you'd have one. Um, but there's um, plastic bracelets. You know, you pay twenty-five pounds and you've saved um, the ocean from plastic. But I think that that's there's an enormous, enormous change, um, and. Um, and I think it's going to get, not worse, but different. But having said that, simple can be reassuringly expensive. <laughs> you know, the, the easy thing is to fill a room with flowers and cover up all the bad bits. The difficult bit is to produce a buffed up, polished, pared down. I have to tell you, these guys, Folly, um, do the most beautiful zinc-topped tables and lime wash tables. So you don't have to have tablecloths, it's a chic look. You can then do flowers that are just jam jars and single, single blooms. You don't need to have this great... I mean, in fact, I saw one the other day. I went to a, a, another wedding show, and I just can't tell you. I looked at the arrangements of flowers, and they were just huge. And everything in my being said, it's over. It's finished. We need to get back to something that's much more pared down. But pared down at a price. Right, I'm going. <laughs> goodbye, goodbye. <laughs>